How much do you really trust your best friends? Would you trust them with your secrets? With your life? Skylar Niece thought she could until one fateful night changed her life and the lives of her two best friends forever. Most people could never imagine killing another human being. Imagine being the kind of person that could murder their own best friend. Today we're looking at the murder of Skylar Niece, which is so shocking, confusing, and unexpected that no one could ever predict the killers had once been two people who cared about her more than anyone else in the world. In July 2012, Skylar went missing from her home in Star City, West Virginia. Born in February 1996, Skylar was the only child of Mary and Dave Niece. She aspired to become a criminal lawyer and had a part-time job at Wendy's. The last time Skylar was seen alive was on July 5, 2012, when she was caught on a security camera outside her apartment building. The camera caught her sneaking out of her bedroom window and getting into a gray sedan. The sedan belonged to Sheila Eddy, Skylar's childhood best friend. They met in elementary school when they were eight years old and had that kind of closeness where they were more like sisters than friends. They used to come and go from each other's homes freely and hung out together all the time. When they started at University High School, Sheila met and befriended another Another girl called Rachel Shaw. All three girls bonded quickly and for a time would be inseparable. However, as they got older, a rift started to form between Skylar and her other two friends. Sheila and Rachel both came from families with divorced parents, and Skylar would act as a rock of emotional support. Sheila was allowed a lot of freedom, and Rachel, who came from a strict Catholic family, often looked to Sheila to make life more interesting. Skylar's parents were more strict about curfews and what she could do with her free time, as well well as nurturing her hobbies and intelligence. The differences in their upbringing started to show as Sheila and Rachel got into drinking, experimenting with drugs, and hooking up with boys. Pretty much every second of their lives was documented on Twitter. From what they ate to their latest fallout, Skylar tweeted more than once about feeling left out about her friends and like she couldn't trust anyone. According to her family and classmates, Skylar and Sheila had started fighting a lot over pretty much everything. Skylar and Rachel were always competing to be close closer to Sheila, and more often than not, Rachel was the one in her favor. This was hard for Skylar, especially since she was Sheila's first friend. But what couldn't be found on Skylar's Twitter feed was the secret that may have cost her her life. As she tried to keep up with the rest of the group, Skylar got into drinking and smoking when she was with her friends. In her diary, she wrote about something that happened during a sleepover at Rachel's house. All three girls decided to raid the liquor cabinet and got a little tipsy. Back in the bedroom, Skylar was utterly shocked when, according to her, Rachel and Sheila started making out. She wrote that this went on for a long time and she was super uncomfortable in the room with them as it happened. But she didn't want to leave because she knew if she did, Rachel's mom would find out about their drinking and she didn't want anyone to get in trouble. So Skylar kept it a secret, but it definitely impacted the friendship, which only brought Rachel and Sheila closer together. They started spending more time together without Skylar, going for joy rides outside of town so they could smoke without getting into trouble. Sometimes they would dress similar at school just to make Skylar jealous. But for some reason, the trio stayed friends and kept hanging out together. To anyone else, they looked like a typical friendship group that had a lot of drama. What no one realized was that Rachel and Sheila really didn't want to be friends with Skylar anyway. Well, why didn't they just stop talking to her and hanging out with her? Their solution to getting Skylar out of their lives was much more permanent than that. It was just after midnight when Skylar crawled out of her bedroom window and ran across the parking lot into Sheila's car. The girls had been trying to convince her to sneak out to get high with them all evening, not letting up until Skylar agreed. Skylar got into the back seat and they started to drive towards Brave, a town just over the Pennsylvania border that they'd been to before. When they arrived, they sat down in the woods. Even though it was over 90 degrees, Rachel and Sheila both wore hooded sweatshirts and when Skylar stood up to get her lighter from the car, they brought out the knives they'd been hiding under them. On the count of three, they ran at Skylar and started stabbing her. Skylar's last word was why. Nobody noticed anything was wrong until the next morning when Skylar didn't show up to her job and her parents realized she never came home because her bedroom window was still open. They called Sheila to ask if she'd seen her. The story she spun was they had snuck out to go and smoke, but they dropped Skylar off close to her house so she could sneak back in without waking anyone. As soon as word got out that Skylar was missing, rumors started spreading like wildfire. The most common theories were that she'd run away from home to meet up with a stranger from the internet, or she'd gotten too wasted at a 
the party died and the people there panicked and got rid of her body. Skylar's parents knew she hadn't run away. This wasn't the first time she'd snuck out and her dad knew when she left her window open, it was so she could get back in. So she was planning on coming back. Also, she hadn't taken any of her things with her. No toothbrush, clothes, or contact lenses. The idea that she'd run away from home was ruled out pretty quickly by investigators. Attention turned to Rachel and Sheila, who'd been playing the role of devastated friends who just wanted Skylar to come home. They continued to be active on social media, posting on Skylar's Facebook page about how much they missed her. Sheila even helped to put up flyers, asking for help to find Skylar, knowing that she was dead. The investigators weren't totally convinced by their act. Jessica Colbrink, a member of the local police department, was suspicious of Sheila from the start. Sheila was devoid of emotion. Unless you asked questions she didn't want to answer, then she could turn on the tears. Some of the things the girls did after Skylar went missing definitely made them suspicious. For one, the week after the murder happened, Rachel went off to her church summer camp as if it were any other summer. Sheila was still having a social life and was often seen out having a good time with her friends. This wasn't the kind of behavior you'd expect from two people whose best friend is missing. Chris Berry, a state trooper, was assigned to the case and came up with the unique idea to figure out what these girls were really up to. He created a fake social media profile portraying himself as just another high school boy from West Virginia and started looking through all the social media posts he could find. What he found didn't sit right with them. Chris noted that the girls would make like 30 posts about partying or skipping school, then every now and then would post something like, come home Skylar, we miss you so much. Almost as if they were trying to go about their lives, but still trying to look sad enough that people still believed they were innocent. What really confirmed Rachel and Sheila's involvement was more CCTV. The investigators weren't able to get very far with the video from Skylar's parking lot. The footage was so blurry that they couldn't even tell what color the car was. After some digging, more footage popped up from a gas station, which clearly showed Sheila's gray sedan heading in the direction of the Pennsylvania border. As well as that, Rachel and Sheila's phones were both detected by a phone tower near Blackville, which they would have had to pass through to get to the border. Each time both girls were interviewed by the police, it was like they were slowly chipping away at their fake innocence. They noticed that each time they spoke to her, Rachel seemed more and more nervous. On the other hand, Sheila was always calm and confident and knew how to make excuses for changes or plot holes in her story. Investigators said that wasn't something they saw often even in experienced criminals. They decided to have the girls take lie detector tests. Sheila agreed to take one, thinking she'd be able to pass it, but her confidence wasn't enough to beat it. On her way to the station to take the test, she panicked and jumped out of her dad's car, running away, and eventually ending up in Sheila's mom's vehicle as she was on her way to collect Sheila's electronics. After this, the community started to turn on Sheila and Rachel, including Skylar's parents. Skylar's mom made a post on Facebook confirming that she believed the girl had something to do with her daughter's disappearance. The negative attention from the police, their neighbors, and other kids at school got so much that they switched to being homeschooled. Then in December, Rachel snapped. Her parents called 911 when she started having some kind of breakdown, screaming and hitting her parents so much that they couldn't contain her. Rachel was taken to Chestnut Ridge Center, a mental health facility for careful monitoring. A few days later, along with her lawyer, she walked into another interview and simply said, we stabbed her. Over the next few hours, Rachel confessed everything to the police. She told them about the plan she and Sheila had made over a month before the murder took place, how they wanted to do it before Rachel went to camp, and how they'd hidden the knives, a shovel, and a change of clothes in the trunk of Sheila's car so they were ready. She told them that the ground was too cold for them to dig a grave, so they left Skylar at the side of the road and covered her with leaves and branches. When the investigators asked why they did it, she said that they just didn't like her anymore. Skylar's body and cell phone were recovered covered at the crime scene, which led investigators to discover that there were still traces of Skylar's blood in the trunk of the car. Rachel and Sheila were both arrested. Having struck a deal with investigators, Rachel pleaded guilty to second degree murder and sentenced to 30 years, but would be eligible for parole after 10. She cried throughout her trial and read out a long apology to the niece family. Sheila pleaded guilty to the first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after
after 15 years. She had nothing to say to Skylar's family, who at one point had treated her like one of their own. There's still some speculation over why they decided to kill Skylar. My theory is that they were scared she was going to tell people about what happened at the sleepover. Skylar could have even been blackmailing them. This theory is kind of supported by the fact that in 2020, Rachel married a woman in prison. To me, it seems like maybe they were much more than friends, but were scared to say anything, especially as Rachel came from a Catholic family. Even if that was the case, they will never be able to justify what they did to Skylar, who was meant to be their best friend. What do you think of this case? Do you really think Skylar was murdered just because her friends didn't like her anymore? I can't wait to read your thoughts down in the comments below.